Good morning or afternoon, everyone. We thank you for joining us for the second session of six in our 2024 Tennessee Farmers Market Vendor Boot Camp webinar series. I am really, really excited for this session today uh, that has been named Head Turning Sales Surging Merchandising Strategies for Your Farmers Market. Um, I am equally honored to uh, welcome our special guest presenters here from uh, University of Kentucky Extension, uh, Brett Wolf and Tim Woods. Brett is a senior extension specialist in the agricultural economics department of the University of Kentucky and coordinates their fabulous Center for Crop Diversification and also their SARE program. And I'll be sure to, to share the uh, Center for Crop Diversification website um, with you in the chat uh, and in the follow-up email because there's some really great resources there uh, that we often send folks to. So take time to check that out. Uh, Dr. Tim Woods is an extension professor for the University of Kentucky, also involved with the Center for Crop Diversification. His work focuses on agribusiness management and marketing with a special emphasis in horticulture, food business development, consumer and direct markets, and farm entrepreneurship. We've worked with uh, Tim a lot. Uh, he has shared his Market Ready program with us here in Tennessee several different times over the years about marketing products to restaurants, grocery stores, and institutions. Uh, and we're also continuing work with uh, Tim and others at the University of Kentucky in our value-added dairy work. So it's always great uh, to have you with us. Uh, and we really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us today. Um, uh, just a, a note of housekeeping for participants, and I'll try to manage this as well. If you would keep your uh, videos off and um, your microphones off, that will help us with bandwidth into some more rural parts of our state and also help with any distractions. If you have a question, feel free to put that in the chat if you'd like everyone to, to see or a comment, or you can also put it in the Q&A box if you want that just sent to me and to Brett and Tim. So that's how we'll manage questions today. And then uh, we will we'll, uh, try to, to fit those in as we go and at the end. Brett and Tim, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much again for being with us today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, our pleasure. Happy to be with everybody. So really what we're talking about in a broad sense here today is visual merchandising. And so just to give you a sense of how this is going to go, I'm going to start out talking about some of the overview kind of key concepts that we're going to talk about. And then if you could see over our shoulders here, we have this nice uh, display of uh, artificial fruits and vegetables. We're going to try a second camera angle to hopefully do some more uh, visual demos of these, these visual principles. And then we're going to come back here and Tim's going to show us some more examples and talk through uh, kind of taking us big picture back to some other processes like sampling and other things that we might want to do to enhance uh, the overall process of selling stuff through these uh, these types of visual and, and uh, customer experience approaches. So before I even jump into some of the variables here, I think when we talk about any marketing concept, it's really important to connect this back to understandings of what your brand is, what your value proposition to consumers is. And everything I'm going to talk about today can help you to tell that story or to detract from that story if it's a distracting, if it's done a distracting way or done wrong. Um, so consider what aspects of your product you want to highlight. Also considering what sells, what your customers actually enjoy. Why do your customers like to buy from you? What is it about your products that they particularly place a high value on? Because those are the things that they're going to buy. Those are the things they're going to pay a premium for. Uh, in addition to the actual vis the visual appeal of your products as you're setting up your booth or you're setting up your retail space, there's a couple other key considerations. One is what is your customer's experience within that space? Are they crowded or they, does it, do they feel cramped? Uh, is it easy to find information that they need in order to make a purchase or to ask you questions? 
And the other variable I would think about too, when we're dealing with specialty crops in particular, is what is, is what is your ability to keep your products fresh, your displays full and attractive throughout the course of the day. So those are a few things that are kind of prerequisites. A few more prerequisites before we jump into some of the tips and tricks. Keeping things clean and neat or clean and tidy. You're selling food. One of the biggest concerns across consumer sectors is food safety. And a dirty or untidy stand can convey a lack of professionalism at best and a risk of foodborne illness at worst. So if you think about when you go into a grocery store, you go into a traditional retail space, keeping things tidy, keeping things focused on the product and a sense of cleanliness and food safety is where you're, those are the types of places that you really wanna shop. Clutter is a distraction. Again, back to that sense of brand and 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 your value proposition. Clutter is, is a distraction from your central message. It can also stress some customers out. And what we wanna do is we wanna help them focus on our product. So this is a prerequisite for what we're talking about here. Product quality is another prerequisite. Before we jump into tips and tricks for how to attract people and catch eyes and all that kind of fun stuff, if you don't have a high quality attractive product, then the rest of these practices aren't gonna be particularly useful. I, I liken visual merchandising to the frame around a picture. It can enhance it, it can bring out elements of it that weren't as obvious before, but if the picture in the frame isn't very nice, you're probably not gonna remark on the quality of the artwork. Same way here with the product quality, visual merchandising can help us to enhance what we're doing, uh, but product quality is, is often one of the most highly rated aspects of local food products as far as what consumers are looking for. So consumers are looking for a high quality product and a food safe product. So we have to assure that those things with clean and tidy and product quality are in place. Um, passing off low quality products through some uh, smoke and mirrors of visual merchandising might work in the short term, but it is a very uh, short sighted approach because then you may have sullied your reputation and even worse, maybe the reputation of the market in the mind of the consumer. So. If you haven't don't have processes in place or you haven't looked into enhancing and retaining or maintaining the quality of your product throughout the whole process delivering it to your consumer, you might want to look into that. Uh, the last prerequisite here that I have is thinking about you as part of your visual merchandising display. So depending on if you are a uh, what a bombastic person like me who's able to go out and talk and shake hands and meet people, you may not have a problem with this, but if you're a little bit more into the growing side or the production of your product side, maybe you're a little hesitant to acknowledge that you are part of the products that you're offering. Um, another aspect of, of thinking about you in a farmer's market setting is that we are coming often from a farm and you may have been harvesting that morning or weeding that morning or the cows got out that morning, whatever it is. Uh, one of the things that we want to think about before we step into a marketing or a retail environment is, am I presenting my brand and my business to the customer as, well, as the best I can? So what are those some of those things that you might think about? Well, one is if you had an irrigation line blow and blew muddy, dirty water all over you, you might want to think about changing your shirt, right? To step it up from there, if you haven't invested in any sort of a uniform material, whether that be a t-shirt or whether that be a polo shirt, you can see I'm wearing our recently acquired UK swag to give a little bit of credence to what I'm going to say to you today. Um, thinking about your presence and how you're presenting to the customer, again, connecting back to that brand is another part of your display. When you're at a farmer's market display, you have the opportunity to talk to the consumer, to convey information through the way that you're dressed and the way you present yourself that's just not available to someone who sells wholesale and their products end up sold to a consumer far from where they are. So um, I mentioned a uniform shirt as a potential option, uh, things like aprons, things like uh, name tags or hats. It just gives a sense of consistency. And again, if you're, if you're, conveying a rustic down home country brand of vegetables the way that grandma used to grow them. You don't need to be wearing a three piece suit to sell these things to these folks, but having that sense of professionalism gives a sense that I've, I've thought enough to get a t-shirt or a, you know, polo shirt made. I thought enough to clean it and put it on. I'm probably handling your products in a way that it also is thinking about the quality and pre-planning and, and having things together. So those kinds of subtle messages, um, or part of that. I used to work at a farm, uh, one of the research farms, and in the evening I would teach classes 
uh, on campus. And I would have to just keep a clean set of clothes in the truck at all times, because I knew that the day that I would plan to just go from the farm to, to the class would be the day that something crazy happened. So that's just something to think about, about cleanliness, uh, per professional presentation, and uh, another aspect of you, and I mentioned I'm, I'm bombastic and I'm, I am talkative and all those other things. Um, I met a lot of uh, farmers market vendors whose approach to sales feels a little more like the approach I would take to hide and seek. And they're the hiders. They get behind the table. They sort of peek out from behind it, hope that somebody's going to come out. And another aspect that you might think about in the presentation of your materials, the presentation of your products is thinking about your sales approach, greeting people, inviting them in, but not being overly uh, uh, ambitious or aggressive is something else. We, we talk about that in a separate presentation about like kind of approaches to sales uh, technique and customer engagement and that sort of thing. But that is another part that we had to think about. It's not just you set up a beautiful stand and people come up and buy the stuff and you're not involved at all. So to that point, uh, one of the things that I do encourage people to think about a little bit, I mentioned the user experience, which is you know sometimes used to describe websites or apps. They talk about user experience and whether it's frustrating to use the app. Um, I have just some different configurations here based on a 10 by 10. The black square would be a 10 by 10 uh, farmer's market stand space. It tends to be pretty standard. Those are the pop-up tents about that size. The brown rectangles I have here are tables. And the purple little squares I have here are that last variable I just talked about, which is you. Sometimes we think about setting up a space for customers and forget that you need to be there and ideally accepting money and payment and other types of uh, uh, compensation for the lovely things that you're selling. And so um, some of these here, like for instance, uh, I'm not sure if you could see my pointer, but the third column, second row, standing there in the, you standing there in the middle in between all these lovely tables, that feels very cramped to me. It feels like you're going to create a long line behind you uh, and you may isolate customers who are doing their classic farmer's market flyby where you do one lap to see what everybody has and then you come back to actually buy things. Um, comparing that to something where you maybe just have one table on the top far left here, maybe you just have one table, but you're able to keep that table very full. You're able to greet customers on either side. Um, Thinking through your flow plan, floor plan and flow is something that I think you will do over time as you as you get more experience as a vendor, but it's something that you want to be paying attention to. Again, that user experience, are the lines backing up? Do people seem cramped? Uh, do people seem irritated? Are you having really long lines? Are you able to accept payment in two locations maybe as, a, as a, an upgrade there? Um, and so I think one tip here would be sometimes we always want to do, uh, there's a reason, or sorry, there's a reason why plays, you know, productions, musicals have rehearsals and dress rehearsals ahead of the night that they put the show on. And so if you wait until the first Saturday morning of the year to figure out how you're going to set stuff up or to execute your plan, it might be kind of a stressful experience. And so it's, it, you're, it's, Pretty easy to pull out a measuring tape, measure out a 10 by 10 space, set up your tables and just see how things go and see how things look just in your driveway. It's a much lower stakes opportunity, but it is something that's easy to overlook. So the next little bit here, I'm actually going to switch over to a different, uh, different camera and different sound here. So we're going to see how that goes. But uh, I'm going to step over here and show you a few items and a few examples. You all hear me okay? Sounds great. Good. Okay, great. So I had on that slide there, um, and let me actually uh, stop my screen share so you can see me in full, my full, and, and maybe if, are you able to pin the video? There we go. All right. So there's a couple of different kinds of visual cues that uh, we tend to think about with visual merchandising. This is sort of the, you've gotten past the prerequisites, we're moving into something that's a little bit more tips and tricks and things that I can actually implement, right? Um, once you decided the flow of the setup, you want to figure out where things are going to be placed. You get to think about what types of products draw people in, what are the things that you sell where you actually make more of a premium, all those things kind of factor in. 
But um, I, to focus on a couple of the principles here, one of the things that we talk about in a retail setting is this idea of me to I. And so right now, this setup is set up relatively flat. And a knee to eye principle here is that we want to take up this whole section from the level of your knee to the level of your eye, all of that visual space, and offer products to consumers across that whole space because it's easy for people to take in a lot more information when they can see it all laid out neatly. And on top of that, if you think about the pain of stretching to reach something overhead, the pain of stretching down to reach and grab something off the floor, we don't want to make it so spacious and so vertically uh, expansive that it creates problems for our customers. And so one little trick I'm going to do here is I have a, one of my containers that I've used, and I'm just going to push this out here. Still kind of staggering it with our thing here. I'm going to take this. I'm going to put these items down here. Now, there are some folks who actually invest in creating a whole display, and if you want to do that, that's something that you can do to stretch the amount of space that's available. Another item that I have here is just a little shelf unit. That's a very uh, generous term for what I have. It's actually just a couple of pieces of plywood that are nailed together that allow me to get from down here in this vertical plane up into more of this space. Now, we could take this even higher. Uh, the higher you go, the more we deal with the favorite farmer's market element of wind, uh, which can easily turn any display or sign into a brand new parasailing accessory. But <clears throat> the more that you can expand and give some visual height, it also helps you to, you can stack things and then create space for depth where you're able to kind of give this sense of fullness and completeness and also capture a wider range of your uh, viewers line of sight so they're able to, to, to find those things. Another component here is, um, so, and so just for example to you, so you obviously could, could bring these types of things down here and now you've got a bigger amount uh, of space to display and you also have this vertical stretch to the uh, to the appeal of your stand. Another component here is the idea of abundance. So this is one that we talk about a lot in grocery stores and you go in there and it's always full, right? At the same time, there's always someone in there who's constantly restocking and restuffing the displays full of product. It's very rare that you go into a grocery store, especially back before COVID, it was very rare that you go into a grocery store and you would see three apples left in an apple display. They wanna constantly keep things abundant. Um, so I think there's a couple of different ways of handling that. So one of them is to take and to tip the display toward the consumer. It gives this sense of abundance, like it's spilling out in front of you. We'll have some more examples here on the slides in a few minutes. Um, that can be as simple too, as just taking and kicking this up. So I just have a pulp container. I'm just sitting it under the back of my container. And now suddenly it's leaning towards you. There's, it does give this sense of it spilling forth like a cornucopia. You know, think about that idea. Another aspect of abundance that we can think through is container size. I'm gonna talk more about containers in general, but you can see this container here, you know, let's imagine people have come through and they've bought a couple of apples from us and suddenly things are kind of dwindling, right? And so rather than using this container, we might dump, don't worry, these are uh, plastic, so no, no bruising, I promise. We might dump this over and use a container like this, take that, pitch it up to spill out to folks. So one easy way to make it look like you have more product than you do is to put the product in a smaller container. And the same thing carries over to the stand itself. If you are early in the season or things have gone uh, bad weather-wise or whatever, and you have a limited amount of product, Use a four foot table or a six foot table. Don't get out your eight or 12 foot table and then have, you know, 12 pints of strawberries on it. Take and condense the more, if you have a smaller amount of real estate, it makes it look like things are a little fuller. Another way to do that 
is to use the same size container, but this is where we get into a little bit of trickery. So I'm gonna take these pint containers, I'm gonna put them in the bottom here, to fill out the space. You could use a plastic, a Ziploc bag, you could use any number of things here to fill this space. Add the apples back in. And voila, we have a full apple display with the same amount that we had before. This seems silly, but all kinds of retail environments use this exact trick to give you a sense that there's this huge barrel full of apples that's there. And it may not be that everyone thinks that the barrel is full or that this is full, but subconsciously we do really uh, react to this idea of a full container in this sense of abundance. So this is helpful, A, if we wanna make it look like the small amount that we have is more than we have. But it also, let's say you have three times as many apples that you're taking to the market. Over the course of the day, you can replenish these to keep your stock fresh and keep your stock full rather than trying to just fill up, you know, fill up a container like this. And then by the time you get down to the last few apples, it looks picked over. So that's, that's abundance in a nutshell. Another idea here is color. Um, so one of the things that I'll say is that the, the most important color on your table should be the product that you're offering. It doesn't need to be, you don't need to be flashy. You know, we're not Instagram influencers here, at least not me. Um, so one of the ideas that I like to think about uh, is before we get to the products, actual products is how can our tablecloth, for example, highlight different product uh, attributes here. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. So I've got, let me get this cleaned up, neat and tidy, do as I say, not as I do, right? Um, got a couple of different kinds of products here. So we have some cucumbers in this nice brown basket. We got these cabbages and these peppers mixed here. So first we've got the brown tablecloth. I think you can see that, right? We can pull this up and we'll roll it out of the way. Now we've got a white tablecloth. It looks really different, right? Now, you may be thinking if you're a pragmatic person like I am, a white tablecloth at a farmer's market sounds like my nightmare. That may be true, but it's there's different patterns or different colors that you can use. And you all should let me know in the chat who likes the, just visually, who likes the white better and who likes the brown better. We're gonna go back to brown before I spill something. So that's one aspect of color. Another aspect of color is if you're do if you're working with like a lot of our vendors are the pop-up stands, those things act like a filter for our uh like a lighting filter in photography almost. So they're they're taking light and they're allowing light through if they're in any way permeable and they're making things they, they cast kind of a colored hue onto our products. Blue and white tend to look pretty good to inoffensive. Red, a red table or a red topper that's not opaque, one that actually lets light through, is one of the fastest ways to kill the color of your display. So if you're buying one, think about something either in the opaque line that won't let any light through and helps kind of shade your product, uh, extend product quality. But if you're looking at one that lets some light through, white is really nice because that's it's almost like what you have on a photo shoot to kind of make everything, cast everything in a soft white glow. Um, another thing, I think that's a little bit of a stretch, but it is something that I think about within uh, retail environments. If you ever go to a grocery store or any kind of other retail setting, one of the things you should do if you want to look crazy like me is look up at just how much time and energy goes into the lighting that they put into retail spaces. There's, there's kind of the flood lighting, but there's also all kinds of spot lighting. And if you're under a dark shelter, or you're inside of a building that the lighting isn't great in, and I'm gonna do something crazy here, let's see if it works, and the lighting isn't great, you can do, think about bringing in something like this to light up your display. 
you can see that little bit of lighting, especially on camera, it looks really nice. Can help to light things up. These are just USB powered, inexpensive little lights that I've used. Um, it's a way to bring that bring that lighting in and communicate that stuff visually in a way uh, that I think it's almost like the moth to the light, right? We're drawn into it. I'm gonna go back to the full light here. A um, Couple other things I'll note. If you haven't ever explored color theory as a concept, it's a very deep rabbit hole. But you know, if you are excited about that idea, go for it. Um, but if you get this this color wheel, you can either take and pick things that are across from each other on the color wheel, sort of these contrasting colors, which is sort of like red and green, purple and yellow. They tend to make each other the the yellow. So if I take the yellow away. The purple looks kind of flat, especially in that basket. I bring it in, suddenly the purple looks a little brighter, the yellow looks a little brighter. Another thing you can think about is this idea of monochromatic color schemes where you have just all green or all of one product. That might be what you'll do just for simplicity. Um, but you can really play around with different aspects of color. Another thing that you can do is if you have a tablecloth that's kind of a neutral color like this, you can play around with bringing in some, these are just little um, placemats, bringing in little, tag in the back, little pops of color like that, that suddenly set things off a little bit. Um, I chose not to use the red here for this because I want the product, the product color itself to stand out. Um, so I mentioned that the product should be the most important color on the table. This to me would be a no-no because suddenly all I'm looking at is the basket itself, right? Um, so I would stay away from things like this, muted tones, natural tones, uh, unless you're, you know, want it to be super fun then go, go for it. But in general, I find that kind of a distracting thing. Okay. Uh, signs and signage is another aspect of the merchandising side of things that I think uh, we shouldn't overlook. So I have here, just as an example, of a, this is something that's available from our Kentucky Proud folks, um, our local mar marketing program. You can do cost share programs where you actually have signs like this printed for your brand uh, with your logo and it'll have a Kentucky Br uh, Proud logo on them. Lots of folks go this route. You can certainly have tablecloths printed with the farm brand on it. Um, one thing I would say about this, sometimes I'll see people and they'll put their farms, their farm, um, sign thing down in front of the booth exclusively. And then they've got a long line of people who are all standing in front of it and nobody can see what the farm is. So if you can consider elevating it, I know we're dealing with wind and all kinds of other fun stuff, but uh, you can consider elevating it or maybe getting it printed on the topper of your, uh, if you have a tent or something like that, it's something I would think about, but make sure to explore if you have any in-state uh, cost share programs for that type of stuff. That's something you definitely want to take a look at and explore. Let's see, what else here? So pricing. We talk a lot about pricing. Farmers market prices is one of our big draws for the Center for Crop Diversification. We actually post, uh, Dr. Margarita Valandia collects prices for Tennessee from farmers markets, and we post them on our site. We also post those prices from uh, Kentucky as well. So be sure to go over to the website that Megan shares. But pricing signs are, to me, they're one way, one of the ways that you can help sell to introverts. Because my wife is an introvert. She is not going to approach and ask how much the strawberries are. You've just lost a sale. It's also just a way to communicate with your customers, make them feel at ease, make sure that they have as much information going into the sale as they can. Uh, generally speaking, we recommend prices for everything clearly listed. Uh, there are opportunities to people. Some people, depending on the product they're selling, will use just like a chalkboard sign. If it's obvious what each item is, the chalkboard sign can really work. But if you're selling some products that some consumers may not know what they are, it helps to have the price in the place of the product. That To that point, I know that these aren't beans, but I didn't couldn't find the cucumber sign. And so I just dropped the beans in there, in there as an example. I have a couple of different examples of types of price signs or types of informational signs. Um, so these are just kind of like, it's black cardboard with, I think, like a white out pen or a white pen on them, kind of simulating that French country chalk board sign. Uh, these are ones that are available. You can see down here, it says Kentucky Proud. These are available at cost from our Kentucky Proud program. 
This is one that one of our local markets, I can bring it up and show it to you closer to the camera. One of our local markets actually went in to create their own price signs that they use. And so they distribute these to their vendors and folks are able to use those. One of the questions that I asked a lot is what about these clips? If I had just invested and started selling clips to farmer's market vendors, I might've been able to retire by now. I just got these on Amazon. I think they were called price card clips. So if you're wondering that, which you probably are, that's where I got them. So this is an example, just a small example of a difference in kind of conveying aspects of a brand through small little uh, embellishments like signage. So one of my coworkers wrote this one, I wrote this one, and I wrote this one. To me, the handwriting, the color of the ink, all of those things are just small little differences that kind of convey something a little bit unique about the product. Or if I'm going for a little more of the fancy chic rustic here, this one feels a little more like a traditional kind of farm stand, rural uh, type, of, type of messaging. That you may agree or disagree with that, but you can put that thought into it uh, as you're developing your own signage and own embellishments. These are some additional price cards that our folks at Kentucky Proud use. Uh, this is Appalachia Proud. So if you're selling in Appalachian County, um, you can use the, get, get access to these and use those. Um, so lots of different examples there of approaches to price signage. Um, a couple other things you might think about using your signs to convey. If you have special deals, if you're offering you know, bulk pricing or you have a bunch of sweet corn and you're trying to move it, you might think about having a sign out front for that. Uh, similarly, you might have signs to announce when certain crops come in, if it's not immediately obvious. So we've got the first sweet corn of the year. We've got the first peaches of the year. We've got the first tomatoes of the year. Um, even putting into people's minds, have you had your first BLT yet? Tomatoes are here. That type of communication is something you can do through signs. You can also communicate aspects of your growing practices and your, uh, if your customers care about these lifestyle of health and sustainability markers, things like certified organic or things like pest, reduced pesticide or thing like naturally grown. Um, those are things you can convey through signage as well. Uh, one last thing on signage I would think about is if you have maybe call to action on a small thing, either a QR code that'll take you to follow us on Instagram or you have a hashtag or follow us on Instagram, follow us on social media. That's another thing that you can think about having involved in your signage there. Okay, um, so I, we separate these things out from signage into take-home information, um, but I think of them kind of as, as a, a spectrum of the same and same thing. So when I talk about take-home information, I'm talking about things like flyers, brochures, cards, other promotional items, things like this here that you might send home with people. When they check out, you drop it in the bag, you send it home with them. Um, you can maybe... Take some that are from your own farm. If you have others, if you're connected to a broader movement, you can drop those in. You know, for instance, you might have a pamphlet about the farmer's market, about what days the farmer's market's open, or maybe you have a seasonality guide from your market or from your Kentucky Proud folks. All of those types of things. It helps the consumer to have more information. It gives them something to remember you by. Um, another part of that whole spectrum of information communication. So we've got signs. We've got take-home items. Another aspect of that is thinking about your containers and your packaging, okay? So when someone, a customer checks out, they buy that product from you, and then they go home. They have the best strawberry they've ever eaten. Can they find you again if they don't remember your exact spot or your exact face or any of that? Well, if you've sent them home with take-home items, and if you have converted your packaging or gotten packaging that has your brand on it, Suddenly, as I would say, you have, you have bought the highest value tiny billboard within their refrigerator that you could possibly get. So this is just a simple regular clamshell. I got an inexp inexpensive sticker. This is Kentucky Proud because we don't have a farm necessarily, but you get your farm's logo printed on it. You stick it on there and suddenly those amazing blueberries that they had, well, they know that it belongs to ABC Farms. They know about, that it came from there and now you've got a customer that's dedicated. Same thing, well, not here. Um, same thing here. So you can convert a generic brown paper bag to your branded paper bag with a simple sticker. Another aspect or another uh, way that people tend to do this sometimes is they will use, get a stamp. So like a rubber stamp 
that works with uh, with ink. There was one of the local donut shops, one of my favorites. They used to, before they became big and fancy and got their printed boxes, they would get generic pizza boxes and they had a stamp, a rubber stamp. They would hit it, stamp the box, and now they've got their branded donut boxes. And that's what everybody would be excited when they saw a pizza box at 8 a.m., more so than just the cold pizza on a Saturday morning crew uh, because they knew that it was from there. Now they've got their own boxes, they do their own thing, but it is an inexpensive way to turn generic packaging into branded packaging. Now you can go ahead and follow that through and get your branded packaging, all that fun stuff. But um, if you're looking for inexpensive ways to convey your brand, remind people of what your brand is and give them the opportunity to follow up with additional sales from you, that's a really good way of doing it. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Katie Bowman, who uh, was working with and is now working again with Cape Card, uh, talked about introduced me to the concept that there are uh, old there are there are sites that sell party favor or sorry table decorations from from old weddings. So after your wedding's over and you've got thirty six, uh, we have thirty six uh, sunflower embossed or glued on mason jars. What am I going to do with those? There's actually sites where people sell their old wedding party favors. That could be something that you use to kind of uh, enhance your display a little bit. A um, couple of other wonky ideas that you might think about. So um, I tend to try to think creatively about how we might convey things to people. So this might, this is some cherry tomatoes here. Imagine this is full uh, and this is a hanging basket. Maybe. This is a hanging basket that you could maybe have elevated. So it's off the table. It's hanging from your tent or something like that. Maybe if you have something that's really aromatic, like peaches, you could put some of those out. So as people go by, they smell them. This could be a way to maybe display stuff in a quirky uh, and inviting way that might be kind of interesting. So that's, that's one kind of quirky idea. Another one would be to maybe assemble, let's say you sell some meat and some produce and you have a roast package, right? So you got a picture of your roast here and then you've got a roast pan with all the things that, uh, maybe some potatoes in here, here's some carrots, some uh, some cabbage. That could be kind of a creative way to put into people's mind, this is the meal that you could make. All you gotta do is get all the stuff right here. We've got the meal, maybe you sell a meal kit associated with that. So that's another way kind of of creatively, uh, creatively marketing your product through the visual presentation of it. Um, let's see if I have anything else. So I think that's most of what I have for our um, kind of demonstration here, but I'm curious if you all have any other thoughts. Uh, everything that I bought here was really inexpensive. And I actually have a price list for it when I bought it. Um, these, these are just old planting containers. These are like uh, planter containers. They're plastic, would be easy to wipe down as far as that. All of these brown things are plastic, easily wiped down. Um, I just made this out of plywood. I do try it. I didn't want to be the guy from UK who told people to spend $3,000 on their farmer's market display. Everything here is super, super affordable. Most of it came from a Dollar General or something similar. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's mostly what I wanted to cover here. So I'm going to go back over here to the computer for a little bit. And Tim's going to talk to us about some uh, concepts like sampling. Also walk us through some additional examples from other uh, places, other types of retail outlets that we might consider as part of this. So I'm going to switch us back over here. Brett, you may want to weigh in here. Somebody is asking, what's a good source to buy the tablecloths with color options or different options? So I bought these from Amazon uh, and they have them in a wide variety of colors. Uh, if you're interested in sourcing things locally, um, I would talk to maybe some home supply stores or uh, maybe that type of thing. But these are all uh, make sure you get them long enough that they, but not too long. So there's all kinds of different sizes available. And I would say um, the, you don't want it to be just kind of dragging all over the ground, especially since we're going to put food on these things, but you also don't want it to be just exactly the, the blueprint of your, uh, somebody, some other people are dropping some examples in there. You don't want it to just be just the profile of your, of your table. I do like also, um, you can see, on, on this one here, it goes down pretty much almost all the way to the ground. 
that is cool because it gives you a whole space underneath the table where you can store stuff without making the display look messy. Okay. Can you get the blackboard signs at Amazon? Yes. Awesome. Some great, great tips. All right. So I'm going to turn it over to Tim here and uh, let him take us home. All right. Thanks, Brett. Yes. Yeah, so many great uh, ideas. Hopefully you're picking up a few tips and things you might want to take back and try at your own uh, market. Just want to uh, toggle through a few other uh, uh, picture illustration uh, things here. Let's see if we can right now. Get our. All right. There we go. Now we're clicking. Lots of cameras, lots of angles here. Uh, appreciate, appreciate everybody's patience with our uh, trying to present all this stuff visually. Uh, here are just some other pictures, you know, where we can look at in this top left picture, a really nice illustration of the kind of vertical dimension uh, that, that she's got here with her products, a really nice display up and down where you can see uh, both abundance, uh, but then just uh, a lot of easy uh, access. And you see over to the right here, the display of strawberries. People love abundance and love uh, the opportunity to not just feeling like they're taking the last one or or that things have been really picked over, but it's really easy for them to purchase multiple uh, uh, items of yours and that you've got plenty uh, of product available. So one of the things that's so fun about farmer's market products is that there is uh, naturally so much color and an opportunity for you to take advantage of that and put that uh, color into your display and organize them uh, intentionally to really show off uh, just the pretty uh, high quality uh, product that you've got there. This is one of my uh, favorite uh, displays for a couple of reasons, uh, both in terms of the creative color presentation with that sort of checkerboard look, but a couple of things that I wanted to uh, highlight in this display that I think are really uh, clever and uh, thinking about your display and uh, placing your products in a in a very strategic and important way that can help move your higher value items. If you look closely at the at the display here, what you see is the uh, 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 pints or half pint products are close to the front, easy access. The dollars per pound sale that comes from those smaller unit packages are easier for people to uh, access. Uh, a lot of times people are buying, uh, they just want a smaller volume of product and they're willing to pay for that impulse uh, type item. It's just like what you see at a grocery store when you're going through the checkout lane. You'll see those impulse checkout items that that people are seeing as a as an item that they want, but they're not necessarily wanting a lot of that product. But what you see up behind there in the alternative packaging is uh, an opportunity for people to purchase uh, uh, a little bit larger volume of product. It's a little bit lower price per unit. You can see the $5 for twice the amount as opposed to $3 for the uh, uh, pint containers. But even if you want to get a bulk discount still, they're offering this two for $9. And so encouraging people to uh, uh, have an opportunity to get a sale from uh, uh, purchasing a little bit more product like that. So just think about the placement of product like this and uh, uh, making your higher value, higher profit margin products as accessible as possible. That should be the prime real estate on your, uh, on your display. So many other things we'd love to talk about and some neat ideas. Just the last couple of things before maybe we go to some questions. Uh, here again is this 
a demonstration of abundance, just some beautiful different colored beans, but really stacked high. Uh, st stack it high and watch it fly is how they say in the produce world. Uh, uh, you know, when you have a random weights pricing uh, approach with your display, of course, you want to keep the display uh, fresh and full. And so you have to keep on top of that. The advantage, of course, is you have less packaging costs, uh, 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 but you do have to keep on top of the fact that customers are going to pick through this product a little bit more, and you have to be mindful of sanitation uh, with handling. Uh, certainly, as we've gone into COVID, people are more and more sensitive about uh, other people having picked uh, through the product, and so uh, a lot of people actually prefer, even if you have a random weights uh, a display option there for you as the vendor to uh, handle that product, load it, have your gloves, put it into the various bag or container. You will have to have certified scales if you're going to do a random weights uh, uh, pricing there uh, in uh, in any kind of a, a product that you're going to use. Brett had showed you uh, some of the display items, particularly around pricing. When people come to visit your your uh, farm stand, uh, they may love your product, but if they have to guess at what your price is, it's really, really difficult for a lot of people to start that conversation and make these inquiries around how much is that product. And so having the price uh, really, really clearly displayed and easy to read, uh, Brett was talking about different kinds of a penmanship and signage, I would just add one other thing is that make sure that it is really, really easy to read. If you yourself have a little bit of a, a illegible penmanship, think about reaching out to somebody that has really good handwriting and can uh, make uh, that display really uh, clear and attractive. Even in the writing and penmanship there, it can add uh, a really nice dimension to your uh, display. Uh, thinking about uh, just packaging there again in the display, I love to show this kind of a contrast with things like peaches. Uh, you can have a, a regular box display like you might encounter in a grocery store with the uh, display there on the left. But if you look over at this packaging there on the right, there are several things that I think are really compelling about a display like this. Firstly, you see the name of the farm that's connected to it. And uh, having packaging, even where you're just stapling on some kind of a, a, a farm logo, farm contact information, as Brett said before, there anything that you can put on your packaging that connects your farm uh, to the customer as they're taking that product away, the, the packaging will keep on selling. And that's just a really valuable thing that uh, is often overlooked. But the other thing that I like about this particular container Containers can really make a difference in terms of the retail appeal and the value to customers. You all know what peaches look like when you have a big box and people are picking through those and what the last few peaches look like. A consumer is going to be much more inclined to pick up a peach container like what you see here on the right, uh, maybe even buying more peaches uh, just because they know that they haven't been picked through, they're getting a good abundant quality of product in a container like that. And so packaging can really make a difference in terms of uh, not just your display, but your uh, sales from your product there as well. So the last thing I just want to uh, kind of touch on a little bit is the idea of sampling. When people come to your, uh, to your booth, it's an experience. There's a shopping experience that is uh, put together with how the product looks, how they're able to understand uh, the pricing, their conversation with you as a vendor. But many of our producers have, have taken advantage of moving into sampling. And a few years ago, we had done this uh, uh, survey of our Kentucky patrons visiting farmer's markets, asking them what were the things that they really wanted to see in a farmer's market. And of course, things like debit card and parking, expecting those things to be really important. But look at what is at the top of the list here, sampling. 
People wanted to try the product, even more than having restroom access, which you would think would be really important. But that sampling experience and having that opportunity to try products, especially if it was something maybe they weren't familiar with or they wanted to just try maybe a different a variety uh, of a product. Some products are a little bit unusual. You have something like these microgreens that uh, these guys are offering out there and, and having them encourage folks to try these products and get a little bit of a sense of the sensory and the flavor uh, that corresponds with some of these a little bit unusual uh, kinds of products before you actually step in and try those. Uh, one of the things that we found out of our research work is that uh, when people sample your product, it makes a huge difference in terms of their intention to purchase that product. Uh, after people sample that product, we have a huge majority of people that say, yes, I purchased that product and I hadn't planned to in the first place. Uh, and so sampling makes a big difference, really would encourage you to think about how you can incorporate sampling into your activities there at the farmer's market. One of the resources that we've put together uh, here at our CCD uh, group is this best practices guide, tips how to do sampling well. So much more we could talk about in terms of, again, display, presentation, special screens and, and cups and, and uh, accessibility, uh, that are all important aspects for the sampling process, how to do sampling well. I would encourage you to uh, pull down a free copy of this uh, best practices sampling guide here to have a, just a, a look through there and, and get some tips uh, of the trade from some things that have worked for others. We have a lot of our research findings that are included in this uh, um, uh, market sampling market guide there uh, as well. Here in Kentucky, our Kentucky Department of Ag folks have worked really carefully and intentionally with trying to offer uh, sampling certificates and, and uh, helping our, our vendors be prepared in terms of having the right kinds of wash stations and sanitation requirements and how to handle utensils and tools and gloves to make sure the sampling experience is sanitary, uh, presenting still high quality product, making it as easy for the vendor as possible to uh, uh, execute the sampling uh, activity, uh, recognizing that it's just such a big part uh, of, the, of the experience and the impact that that has as well. So Brett, we're kind of here to the, to the final point, maybe bring you in here. Uh, we put a lot of information out there on the table for folks. Maybe you could just sort of pull this last point together here for us about what do we do with all this information? Yeah, so I think, I mean, hopefully as we were walking through some of the tips, some things jumped out that you were scratching down that maybe you'd like to try with your presentation, with your retail display. Uh, one final thing I would encourage you to do, uh, maybe in that final few moments before the chaos of customers coming in, is to actually step out in front of your booth, pull out the, you know, the camera that we all carry in our pockets that's also known as a phone, and just take a quick picture of your stand. Um, and I, I think this is actually something that people have told me that they have done and they were surprised by how useful it was because what it allows you to do is to go back and think, look at it later on after you're you know, back home and, and resting. And you could take a look and see, oh yeah, actually you can't really see those type, those breads. They're kind of hidden in the back. Uh, or uh, I noticed that people were kind of lining up and getting crowded on this one area. Maybe I'm going to change things up and do things a little differently, but this is not going to be a, you just you determine your visual merchandising approach and never again shall it be changed. Um, if you, like me, are irked every time the grocery store reconfigures itself and they move the pasta that has been in one spot for a year to a completely different place, merchandising and, and the cultivation of retail spaces is an ongoing process. And it's something that you're going to want to work on across time. But um, giving yourself opportunities, just like with your finances uh, within your business, just like with your production, the more that you can record a little bit and then be able to reflect and refine refine that that approach, uh, the the better off that you're going to be. Um, so I think yeah, that's that's kind of the the crash course in some of the visual merchandising approaches. So if we have any particular questions or comments, um, we're happy to to take those. Maybe Megan, you can uh, curate any any particular questions. 
Great. First of all, thank you, gentlemen. That was very informative. I love your example examples and Brett, your analogies in particular are quite fun and and uh, help bring it home. So thanks for that. Um, we had a question about um, sources for tents or type of tents or brands or an eight by eight or 10 by 10 for space at the marketing there. Well, I, I would say a little bit bigger space is probably a good idea. It gives people opportunity to get in and, and get around the booth. And if you have a six foot table in the center, you have space on, on multiple sides. As far as particular brands, um, the, I, I, you know, we don't endorse any brands. A lot of folks get the easy up brand. Um, I would say my, my strategy with anything like that is to try to, uh, buy once cry once, uh, which is to say buy, buy a high quality, you're going to take this thing up and down and up and down and up and down. And it's going to get thrown in the back and rained on and wind and everything else. And so, um, rather than buying three cheap ones before you buy a nice expensive heavy duty one, maybe think about investing in that heavy duty one, you know, on the, on the front end. But I, and I tend to, I tend to prefer the opaque, you know, even uh, uh, with the kind of insulated versions with the, the top, the actual canopy is a little bit insulated and doesn't allow light through because as summer rages on and the heat builds up under that tent, both you and your product would like a little reprieve. So that would be another thing I would probably look at. But but you can buy, and if you already have a top, or sorry, you already have a tent, you can buy just the canopy, you know, if assuming that your brand is, is one that has, has parts associated with it to kind of change things out uh, over the course of the year or to repair or whatever. And you want to make sure, you know, whatever market you go to, if what kind of space is available on the size tent as well. That's a really good thought on the insulated one. Um, well, so we have a question here. Given that everything sells better when it looks abundant and full, what do you do when you're almost sold out of a product? Is it better to leave it on the table, maybe put it in a smaller container or just pull it? If, I would say if it still looks good, I would I would try to sell it if I'm still going to be there. Uh, you might even consider combining multiple items into the same container. So if you have, you know, two bunches of carrots and four cucumbers left, you can kind of, you don't have to keep them each in their own separate container. You might end up pulling them out and putting them straight on the tablecloth or something like that. Um, you have any thoughts on that, Tim? Yeah, no, I think that's good. I, and I like the little... Uh, the little dishcloth size kind of thing yeah. there that can also be for a small footprint. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, I think as long as the the quality is good and you've got a decent uh, chance and there's still a little bit of traffic there, you want to keep that product up there to the very end. Sometimes you just have to just say, you know, especially if the quality is starting to deteriorate, the crowd's thinning out, that's good enough for today. Yep. Absolutely. That is so great. And you could, if you have multiple tables, you could take one down and kind of right. push it together right. um, and look busy. That helps to draw attention too. That's it's right. Very good. I cannot see any more questions at the moment, uh, folks. Uh, do you think at the end of the day, do a bottom price? Oh, cut the price, clearance price. I don't, I am not as averse to taking stuff home as some of our vendors seem to be. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, to me, I, if I'm, if I'm cultivating and selling a premium product, I never want to undercut that value. You know, you don't, you don't, it's not like at the end of the day, the Gucci store puts everything on quarter price so that they can, you know, get out of there. It's, it's sort of like you're, you're trying to protect a brand, but if you really are trying to get rid of stuff, I don't know. I mean, there's other options like food banks and things or taking it yeah. on yourself. And I'm always nervous too, about conditioning people when they see that going on a few times, then they start expecting. Yeah. If I hang around here long enough, the price is going to come down <laughs> and just e exercise that discipline. Here's, here's the value of my product. And uh, stand by it. And, uh, yeah, I think that's the, that's my a great gift for the market manager or, or yeah, perhaps right. bank. Yeah, a really nice, nice dinner that night. 
I want to ask ask people, you can leave it in the chat, you know, the folks are pulp container or clamshell. I usually talk about this during the during the presentation and people get real heated about it. So maybe you know, <laughs> we'll get used to each other. But um, I will say anecdotally, I got some strawberries that and in a that looked equally good from two local farms. One was in a clamshell and one was in a pulp container. And about three days later, the pulp container needed to be eaten or maybe should have been eaten a day earlier and the clamshell one's still hanging on. So uh, I think there's lots of contentious, maybe drop in the chat, whether you're a pulp or a clamshell uh, fan. But that is a container selection and different, you know, your brand and are you trying to appeal to folks who shop at the supermarket or are you going for the down home rustic? Yes, or sustainability is a big thing. Exactly, one is, right? is yeah. probably compostable or or yeah. biodegradable and, Some and customers are really thoughtful about that yeah so much to think about some excellent excellent tips uh, here we really appreciate your time brett and tim and uh are so glad that you are are with it um with us today and uh i have dropped the evaluation in the chat and if you're looking for the Tennessee Ag Enhancement Credit, that also serves as your attendance form or participation form. So please take a few moments to, to complete that for us. And join us on Thursday when we'll be talking uh, more about pricing uh, and pricing resources. Margarita Volandia from the University of Tennessee Extension will be with us then. So we appreciate you all. Have a great day and we'll talk soon. Thanks, everybody.